So as you guys know, we are here to talk about LiveView, the future of Phoenix web development, and maybe more. All right, so uh, Francesca, thank you for those wonderful introductions, but just a little bit more about me and Bruce and some things that we really wanna share with you guys. Um, hi, I'm Sophie. You can find me at Twitter, SM underscore DeBenedetto. Uh, I also like to take every opportunity I can to plug Elixir School, which is a free open source online Elixir curriculum. And we are always, always, always looking for contributors. And it's really easy to contribute. You might have an idea for like a full lesson that you wanna write up or maybe just a short little blog post, something that you've been itching to get out into the world, or maybe you wanna translate something because one of the things that I love about Elixir School is uh, it really exists to get Elixir educational content out to the whole world. So we have such a great group of folks that pitch in and translate lessons into so many different languages. Definitely check it out uh, if you're not familiar with it already and uh, think about contributing. You can go to the GitHub repo to learn more about that. And uh, Prag Prag, Prag Prag, uh, you know, Pragmatic Bookshelf is our publisher for the Programming Phoenix Live View book that Bruce and I have out in beta now. So we would love for you guys to check that out. And uh, I'll just do a quick pitch. If, if you've been feeling like you're sitting on a book idea, but you don't know where to get started, you wanna write on something in the Elixir or the Beam universe, I would love to hear about that. So hit me up on Twitter or check out pragprog.com. There's a tab on there about becoming an author. And I'll also just give a nod, as Francesca already did, to the Beam Radio podcast, which is Bruce, me, a couple other really smart folks, including uh, Lars Vickman Underyard, one of our sponsors for Code Beam this year. So it's really just a panel of smart, fabulous, extremely interesting Elixirists who hang out and talk about all things Beam. And we would love for you guys to check it out. And uh, Bruce, I'll hand it over to you. Tell us a little bit more about what you've got going on. Yeah, it seems like there's so much overlap these Oops, days. It's sorry. hard to tell. It's hard to tell where one one agenda starts and the other ends, right? So, um, so Sophie is the future editor, the current editor of the Elixir line of books at Pragmatic Bookshelf. I'm the past editor, but recently I've been working on my own kind of publishing um, content engine called Groxio, and we do one of the things that makes sessions like this one fun is that a lot of the lessons that we've pulled from the books have actually come from the formal trainings that we do at Groxio and the online courses that we have. And so you could, if you want to check out more, you can go to grox.io, only seven characters, won't cost you much. And um, if you'd like to hit me up on Twitter, I'm pretty active there. I am at Red Rabbits. And so I guess we should get going with our first question. There we go. All right. So uh, the first question that we want to dig into is a question that I have for you, Bruce. Can you tell us what makes Live View so effective? Why is it so special? Why are we so excited about it? Yeah, that's a fun one. It's so live view is actually a long time coming. I think that that the live view team, particularly Chris McCord, started thinking about it actually before he even left the Ruby community many, many years ago. So he'd been working on on kind of this idea of server side rendering and didn't really have the consistency or the infrastructure to pull it off. And so over time, he's um, he's kind of been working with a fabulous team at um, with with the Phoenix framework to kind of build the layers one piece at a time. And the first layer was OTP and having that actual, that beautiful consistency and response times. And then, then there was this request response API, but that wasn't quite enough. So they, they layered on this channels API, which, which makes things pretty collaborative. But then, then when it was time to build live view, it was turtles all the way down, right? There are all these beautiful abstractions that, that provide really consistent, stable performance and uh, that were actually tailor built for applications like the ones that you typically build with, with LiveView. And so that's the infrastructure side is one side of the coin. So the other side is equally important and maybe even more so the idea that when you're building an application, a web application, it started as this kind of batch request batch response. And that was easy to think about. And the reason that it was so simple is that it put your head in one place on the server, right? And, and you would have these requests, you kind of roll up 
make it make the connection to the user, roll up everything you needed, and then send down an independent response. But as requests came became more and more complicated, what happened was we started actually building these trap doors that allowed individual communications to either automatically populate a an entry field or automatically scroll as the user rolled down a page or automatically move as the users as the user moved and that separated your brain <laughs> across the client and the server and so live view lets me put my brain in one place firmly on the server and we pushed the back and forth into the infrastructure uh, which is Kind of one of the the main benefits of the of the Phoenix um, of of this this wonderful infrastructure that the Phoenix team has put together. So that's what I like. Um, so Sophie, I have a question for you. Oh my goodness, what could it be? <laughs> so one of the things that we've gotten a chance to write about is this pattern called CRC. And one of the things that's been fun for me is that as we we actually, as I've thought about some of these patterns and presented them to you as a co-author, you've kind of taken them and made them your own. So why do you think CRC is a good fit for, for Elixir applications and specifically for Phoenix Live View? Yeah, I, I really love this topic because when you kind of introduced me to this pattern, it really, I don't want to say it blew my mind. It's more like it fixed my mind, like it made a lot of things fall into place for me. So before uh, we tell you guys what the CRC pattern is and what it looked like in LiveView, I want to tell you about a problem that I had when I was first programming LiveView. And this was when LiveView first came out. I think we were on, if not the first version, like one of the very, very early versions. And I really wanted to bring it into an app that I was building uh, at work at the time. And it was like the perfect fit for what we were trying to do. The team was excited. You know, we were already in a Phoenix app and this was just a little internal uh, kind of admin tool app. So we felt we could, you know, go and, and pull in some maybe bleeding edge technology. And it worked great. And LiveView was really easy to work with and it solved our problem. But I ended up with a problem that reminded me of code that I would write when I was first learning Rails. I would write these really uh, fat controllers. Maybe that sounds familiar to anybody that comes from Ruby or comes from Rails. My live view was really long and beefy and it had so much code in it that was handling business logic, that was handling you know, interactions and updating state based on whatever the user was doing in the UI. And I just felt like I didn't know where to put code. So I came up with different ways to kind of tuck away the different pieces of code that I felt didn't belong in the live view, but nothing felt quite right uh, until Bruce introduced me to this idea that we really draw out, like he was mentioning in the programming live view book, the CRC pattern stands for construct, reduce, convert. So what does that mean? You've seen it already in Phoenix. You see it all the time. This is like a super simplified example of how the uh, plug pipeline works. You start with a con, you hit your endpoint, you maybe run that connection through a couple of plugs and uh, then you render, you see the view rendered. So the con, the connection object is the entity that we are sort of transforming over the course of this pipeline. Each plug does something so that we get an updated state in that connection. And then we are ready to convert it into something that the user can actually look at and interact with. And that's when we actually render out our template. So we construct and we create the starting state and we get back our initial plug con object. We reduce over it with some plugs that updated state and then we convert it into let's say a template that the user can actually look at. So if this pattern looks kind of familiar from Phoenix, you're also gonna see it in live view uh, in various ways. So there we go. Here is a super simplified kind of dummied up example of a typical live view flow. You're going to start out with a mount function. It's the very first thing that gets called when your live view process starts up, when a user navigates their browser to whatever page is backed by a live view. And the mount uh, is going to be working with the socket. The socket is like our core entity that this particular CRC pipeline is operating on. So mount gives you back a socket. Then we have these event handlers. Every time a user, let's say, clicks a button, it's gonna trigger an event handler, which is gonna receive that socket, 
do something to it that updates its state and then spits it back out. And the very last thing that Live View invokes for you in this flow is the render function, which takes that socket and converts it or templates it into the actual template that gets sent down the wire so that the user can see it and interact with it. So mount is our constructor. Our event handlers are our reducers that take in a socket, change the socket and return a socket. And then that gets piped all the way through into render where we convert that socket into something that our users can actually interact with. So we're starting to see this pattern show up again and again, and it becomes really helpful when we start needing to organize our code. But I wanna break this down a little bit more. So the first part of CRC is the constructor. We take in some kind of input and we create the initial state of our entity. Uh, the up there, here's a look at an example update function that you might see in a live view component. Um, update is one of the callbacks that gets called when we start up our component. It takes in a socket, and we're actually already using reducers in this update function with this uh, assign age group filter function. Let's take a look at it. So it's not really important the details of what this code is doing. Just understand that we have a reducer. It's called assign age group. It takes in a socket and it updates that socket by applying, in this case, a new age group filter key. And then we get to reuse this reducer, which is so neat. Let's say that uh, you could imagine there's some sort of filtering, maybe on a form or a view, a user has sent an event that is going to impact that. And we're gonna call our same reducer that we used in our initial setup function. So the great thing about CRC is it really encourages us to build these single purpose reusable reducer functions that start really cleaning up our live views. We can use them to establish initial state when we are constructing our live views. And we can use them again and again in these hands handle event reducer functions that get called in response to user interactions. The very last thing, of course, is our convert. Every time we handle event, we update socket state. Every time socket state updates, live view is going to re-render for you. So it calls that render converter function, which takes your socket and templates it for your user to view and interact with. So that's kind of a look at the CRC pattern. And when I was introduced to this, like it's nothing new, right? Like we've seen it in Phoenix. We've seen the pipeline of plugs that your connection flows through before ultimately being rendered into a template by a controller action. Uh, you've probably written maybe some Ecto querying code that might look a little bit like this. Maybe you make a query, you add some predicates to it before executing it. That's another great example of CRC, executing your query and getting back results. You could think of that as converting, but seeing this pattern, um, really laid out explicitly, I think has helped me write live view code that is so much cleaner. Not only am I writing single purpose reducer functions that help me set up initial state and update that state in response to events, but it's also helping me understand where code goes um, in the bigger picture of my application. And I think that sets the stage very nicely for the next question that I have for Bruce, which is what is the layered approach in programming Phoenix live view? Tell us about this. Yeah, so this is great. So you have this, so Sophie set up beautifully the idea that we have this pattern that says prepare your work, do the work, present your work, right? It's, you know, take these convenient inputs and turn it into something that's convenient for computation. And then you could build these single purpose things all day that take in that convenient piece for computation, which is called an accumulator and spit out another one. Um, that's transformed in some way. And then along the way, periodically, you need to interact with the outside world. And so you use some type of converter and that's that's the render, right? So I'm sure that everybody is that, that hasn't seen this pattern before is screaming at their is well, you know, first turning off video, right? And then screaming at at their at their camera to say, hey, uh, what about what, what about things that break, right? Well, the idea is that you have. Oh, Bruce, it looks like you've gone on mute. Oh, there we so, go. Thank you. So the idea is, is that you have this layering system that allows you to deal with this complexity in times. And, um, and, and, and essentially, you can deal with certainty in the core, right? So. And in the core, so we're going to be doing a lot of composing with our CRC pattern, our construct, reduce, and convert. And then when it's time, when we have to deal with uncertainty, then we can kind of, we could wrap that clean core layer 
with an API that knows how to handle the uncertainty. And that's called the boundary layer. And, and in Phoenix, we implement a boundary with a context. And you'll see all the way through the, the documentation, you'll see words like our, our context boundary or our, you know, the boundary implemented in the context. And, and so the idea is that we have this, this beautiful API that, that actually might not compose as cleanly, right? We need to use a different set of tools. We might have exceptions that, that just let things crash. We might have tag tuples so that implement things like chain sets and things like that. But so the idea is that we can have very skinny functions that access most of the heavy code in, in the core. And we could spend most of our time dealing in pipeland where things are kind of happy and transformations are simpler. And then we can keep the boundaries pretty skinny, right? And then, then Live View is just another client. It's a client of a boundary. And when we approach code in this way, then, then Live View loves us, right? So we can, and not just Live View, but, but Phoenix loves us in general. And so we can actually take this, we take our code where we have the core layer in an Ecto, that means that it's typically schemas and queries, right? We have a boundary layer and at Phoenix, that's a context. And then we have a Live View. And all we need to do is make our handlers really, really skinny. And when we do that, we can call these single purpose reducers exactly like the ones that Sophie built that then they reduce over the socket, right? They take a socket, they transform, they transform the socket using something in the context and then spit out another socket. And so there's this, there's this example of a schemaless change set. So what was cool is that we could kind of build this core layer that had a converter that, that built the chain set um, using the just a, a very narrow slice of the Ecto API. We could wrap that up in a boundary and look at what the view looks like. So this live view looks no different than any other live view, right? Because we have the same concepts implemented in the boundary that control that, that layer of complexity. And then we don't have to think about um, anything except the, 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 tiny, the, the tiny, very skinny handlers and the tiny reducers that we need to build in the live view. Those tiny reducers can be reused across the, um, the update or mount blocks that are our constructors and the handlers. And then everything else is delegated to, um, to the boundary layer. So the live view is skinny. Um, you know, you, 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 the, the render doesn't exist because you slide that into a, um, a template, the boundaries are skinny, and, the, um, and then also the, um, you know, the, the, then we can spend more time in, in the core where things are more beautiful. So I have a question for you, Sophie. So <laughs> the question is, is this, so I, I love this question. Is Live View its own thing or is it part of a greater ecosystem? And why do you think so? Yeah, so it is part of the greater Phoenix ecosystem and that's a good thing. That means that Live View gets to leverage the other tooling that is present in Phoenix to create a really rich interactive world for your users. And I think the best example of this is working with Live View and PubSub. So I'm going to show you guys a diagram that has like a lot of stuff in it, but the details don't matter. We're going to focus on the big picture. So let's say that you've got, uh, and this is an example pulled from the book, you've got a, a survey feature. Users can fill out servings and rate things. And uh, you've got an admin dashboard where your admins can look at the results, excuse me, the results of those surveys. So we can kind of just hook up our live views with Phoenix PubSub so that you would have a user submitting some kind of uh, result to the survey and every admin dashboard uh, that is up, every other admin around the world that's looking at their own admin dashboard live view is gonna see those results updated in real time. And this is what you get when we have, this is what Bruce said earlier, turtles all the way down. Uh, there's nothing, I don't wanna say there's nothing special in live view, live view is very special but it's built out of the basic building blocks that Elixir already provides us. It's built on top of OTP. So you can subscribe your live view, which is just a process 
to a PubSub topic and you can broadcast out over that topic and it can get updates. So we're able to really power up our live views with all of the niceties that OTP provides us and integrate our live views with our broader Elixir and Phoenix ecosystem and just create a really, like I said, holistic interactive world for our users, which I think is really exciting. I think it unlocks so much potential for building really cool things that meet a lot of the needs of, I'm gonna say the modern web, even though I feel like that phrase is sometimes overused. Like it's just, so much more common than not these days to have to build something that has not just some degree of interactivity, but some degree of real time update as well. And uh, because LiveView is a first class citizen within the Phoenix ecosystem, just like PubSub, and it's all built on top of OTP, it's truly trivial to light up some of these interactions, which is, I think, pretty powerful and pretty exciting. So I think that kind of brings us through some of the big picture stuff that we just sort of wanted to seed in your guys' brains. We wanted to talk about the CRC pattern, we wanted to talk about how you can organize not just your live views, but your overall Phoenix app into these core and boundary layers. And we wanted to talk about some of the things that you're able to do in live view because it is such a powerful tool. And now we just wanna hear from you guys. We wanna know what questions you have on these or any other topics. So I think what I'm gonna do now is hop over to the Q&A in Whova. I might stop sharing my screen and uh, we'll just talk. Awesome, I see some questions slowing through. If you do have questions, do go ahead and put them in the Q&A as opposed to the chat since I might miss them if they're in the chat. And you can upvote questions so they already automatically sort a bit. And I'm just gonna start with uh, some of the ones at the top of the stack here. So what about real world problems like latency and most importantly, disconnections? What is the current approach to such situations? Bruce, you wanna dig in there? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take a little bit of that. So the, the first thing is, I think that live view fits really well where um, where you would build a typical JavaScript or, or, or typical online JavaScript and backed application. And, and the reason is that since the communication infrastructure is kind of pushed into, into the infrastructure, then we, we don't really, it's, it's, it's actually more effective to have the, the Phoenix team write those interactions than it is for us, us to customize those interactions piece by piece, right? And we also have, we have access to, the, to a trap door, which is the um, abstraction immediately beneath live view with, with, Phoenix, with um, JavaScript hooks in, in either direction. So what that means is that in terms of performance, I really am not as concerned about, so, so if, if I slot the applications as database backed applications that have single page flows, back and forth flows, which is frankly, most of what we're building today, those are great for, for live view. In terms of running disconnected, it's not great. Um, there's, there's a, um, you're actually going to be coding, writing some custom code to do that. And, and so since you're going to be building out some components in JavaScript anyway, Sometimes it makes sense to share those, but it is worth kind of kind of thinking about a um, an infrastructure where where you write the connected bits in live view because effectively you don't have to write that infrastructure. It's it's hard to get not just the interactions right, but the security right, um, and and it this model fits so much of what we build right now that I think that we're gonna see more and more, um, we're gonna see the universe of things that you can build with a live view um, actually increase. And it's, it's, it's a pretty big universe right now. And you wanna take a shot at that, Sophie? Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I'll just say that um, it's worth calling out that it is definitely possible and supported to extend your live views front end with your own interoperative JavaScript. It's a feature called JavaScript hooks and it's very well documented in the documentation. So if writing your own JS would allow you to use, uh, use live view and solve this problem, it is not at all hacky to write your own JS that hooks into your live view. Yeah, and that comes in two directions, right? It comes you know, uh, in, in both directions. So you, can, you can build the hooks into, into your APIs on the server and then you can actually um, service hooks on the back end on the client and initiate your own communications. Yeah, thanks for adding that, Bruce. All right, I'm gonna move us on to our next question. Which companies are using Phoenix Live View in production? This is a great question, and I feel like I'm more excited to hear from our audience if anyone has anything to share. And I already see that uh, 
We've got an audience member, Oliver Kriska, who says they use it in about 10 apps for more than one year. That's a long time since LiveView is still very new. Um, Oliver, do you want to tell us where, what company you're working for? Mm, hello, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Okay. So, uh, yes, uh, um, our main company is a payment service provider and we use it in uh, back office in the merchant portal where merchants, our clients can use can see uh, information about the uh, data, but the most uh, used and uh, where the more important, the most important application is uh, our checkout form, and we use it with uh, we use it before the live. We use it uh, channels, and we have we had some issues, and after and after we figure out the channels has some boundaries or some some issues, uh, live view came up, and we started using. So we use uh, main, our main application to check out use uh, live view. And we have thousands of people every day which use it. And it's, uh, I can say it's perfect. And I think it's ready for production. I'm going to put that quote on those. the cover of the book, by the way. I'm ready to say it's perfect <laughs> from Oliver. Uh, let's see. Anyone else feel free to jump in in the chat if you guys are using it in production. And then also, you know, we've got our Meet the Sponsors events uh, over the next few days. Go in and ask those sponsors if they're using LiveView in production. I'm certainly curious to hear the answer to that question. Uh, Bruce, I don't know if you're aware or have a handy list of companies. I, I don't necessarily have. Um, yeah, I, 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 tend to, I tend to jump on Google like everybody else does. But, but um, so Groxio has been using LiveView since, um, gosh, since the, the pre-release, since um, we we released our, our first site. Um, it was shortly after it became became publicly available, and we've loved it. It it essentially allows me to build more with less. Um, allows me so before I had to make the choice between building a single page flow, and between building something that I could support with a small team. And this allows me to um, to essentially build the printing press and write the books at the same time, which we could couldn't have have done before. Yeah, and I will, I just want to draw out the thread of one thing that you said, Bruce, something that you could build with a small team. And I think one of the things that I've seen with Elixir and Phoenix from the beginning of my usage of these technologies is how incredibly productive it lets developers be. And LiveView just kind of builds on that principle and accelerates it so much, right? Like Bruce was saying earlier, your brain and the brain of your team is focused on the server. You can write all your interactions by keeping your mindset and your attention and your time on the server side. All of your testing is gonna happen in Elixir on the server side. You don't have the uh, kind of typical development cycle slowdowns of like, I've got my React app over here and I've got to make changes and make sure it's up to date with the contract that the API is exposing. You don't have to worry about how you're gonna deploy you know, front end service A and is it gonna be ahead of API server B? So I think, um, yeah, LiveView, I think is kind of a superpower for teams to start tapping into. Yeah, you said another word that I really like, the word is contract. And so the idea is that we're, we're coding functional systems, functional systems based on reliable foundations and that have a clean layering system established like the one in Phoenix that allows me to have the, the functional core where I could do most of my um, kind of Kind of business business logic. Um, then I can wrap that with a boundary where the uncertainty happens, and then I can, can kind of build this view client. It really allows me to carve up in individual team sized or developer sized problems that 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 really fit development flow very well. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to cheat a little. I think we're going to have time for, for a lot of these questions. So I am just going to sort of cherry pick one that I'm really excited to talk about before returning to the top. So don't worry if I've skipped you. Uh, question on Surface. I read some stuff about components and how LiveView is integrating parts of Surface. What is the plan for the far future regarding components, et cetera? Um, so I know a little bit about this because we had uh, Marlis, who is the creator of Surface, on the Beam Radio podcast recently, and we had a great talk with him. And there's going to be another fireside chat on Surface with Bruce, Marlis, and uh, Timo, I think tomorrow or Friday, check your agenda. Definitely recommend checking that out. And there was also a latest blog post from Dashbit talking about the future of Surface. So there's lots of places to get these details. But what I will tell you is that my understanding of the plan is that the pieces of the Surface library 
that really belong in the live view framework are heading over to the live view framework. So that's like the surface component templating engine, for example. And then the things that will remain in the surface component library itself are the things that are very lightweight and critical to defining and using surface components themselves. So I just think it's really cool to see kind of like this energy and this conversation that's starting to happen between live view as a more mature and established framework and libraries like surface that are developing to meet the specific needs of live view developers as we see increased adoption. So I think there's a lot of fun stuff going on there. And I definitely recommend checking out the session on that topic at CodeBeam tomorrow or Friday, because I forget exactly when it is. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything to add on that, Bruce. No, you did it. You did well. That's exactly right. Cool. Thanks. All right. So we've got another question. Is it possible to use Phoenix Live View to build a really nice app for iOS or Android that can compete with native apps? If yes, what are the key points to be aware of? What are the downsides? Um, I sort of feel like we have bad news on this one. Yeah, you're not going to be using Live View for your mobile web development. Uh, I don't think it really translates. I wish I had more. Is there like a but that we can throw in there, Bruce? I don't know. Well, I think that the main thing is that the economics are different, right? So, um, so you're you're really trying to, um, so so very often on the Internet of Things, the um, bandwidth is really an issue because because the um, the plans that that are typically used are are pretty expensive, and so what you want to do is you want to very tightly control the communication between the uh, the client and server. You don't want to keep an open um, an open communication line um, like the one that you would have in Live View. So you, you wouldn't you wouldn't really run um, even a Live View browser typically in an iOS application, except unless unless it's like a um, like a kiosk or something like that. You could definitely see something like that, but. That to me is more of a, like a like a web app. Yeah, I would agree with that. All right, moving on to our next question. When building complex systems, we see patterns such as microservices or micro front ends. How does this translate into Live View? How do we manage the growing complexity of a Live View app? You want to kick us off with that one, Bruce? Yeah. So I think that the main thing is that Live View um, is is doesn't really offer a new toolkit. But the base toolkit that Phoenix offers already handles some of these problems, I think, pretty well. So um, the, the places to go to look for, for microservice architectures are the same ones that, that you would check out for Phoenix. So you, you want to look at, for example, the, um, just the, the Phoenix documentation, the Programming Phoenix book. The um, the adopting Elixir book though that's that's getting a little bit dated now, um, but what I would say is that the main thing that you need to do to build a smart microservices architecture is to be on a functional language that has these principles baked in and doesn't rely on concepts like inheritance. So, um, I I would say that that has not been the focus of the Elixir language because it's essentially Building small services is essentially part of our DNA, and um, it's it is, is very rarely a specific issue of, um, of of Elixir developers. How do I build a smaller service? I mean, we already know how to do this. Yeah, I think um, just completely agree with everything that you said, and. I'm not an expert on working with something like micro front ends. So I'm not at all gonna make a bold claim like, oh, with Live View, you would never even need a micro front end. But I, I do wanna kind of draw out some of the things about Live View that might mean that you could choose Live View over a micro front end. And the first thing I'll say is that, as we said earlier, Live View puts your brain and all of the work that you're doing on the server side while still per, like supporting really the full set of interactions that. I think most web applications need to present with their to their users. So some of the downsides of microservices where you're splitting up like a micro front end from your back end is coordinating development teams and development life cycles across the back end and the front end, those API contract maintenance issues that we talked about earlier, um, you know, deployment issues and timelines. Uh, you know, the time it takes to remediate bugs and issues and just sort of observe your whole system when you're splitting up back end and front end technologies and teams who are responsible for each kind of all goes away. And I think that's one of the reasons why keeping everything in live view becomes really, really attractive. And then just to echo what Bruce said, Elixir and Phoenix makes it so easy for you to build really small single purpose services. 
And something like the fact that it's very trivial to hook up your live view to PubSub, for example, also makes it very viable to go with like an event driven system. Let's say you've got some sort of Broadway consumer, it's picking a message off of Rabbit, it can just broadcast over PubSub, your live view gets that message and updates the UI. So I think Elixir and Phoenix in particular suit a microservices architecture really well. And I think LiveView has a lot of advantages over something like a micro front end in the development cycle times and focusing your engineers on the back end, making it easier to observe and remediate bugs and issues in production, uh, all within an app that can be slim and small and single purpose and communicate very well with the rest of your ecosystem. Okay, Sophie, Bruce, uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, it's been great. Thank you.